um, this uh, operation. We expected significant funds to be deposited in the state of Mississippi's account. The Congress has, over a repeated number of times, made such deposits. They have included um, millions and tens of millions of dollars of funds. The last funds that were uh, deposited in the state of Mississippi and made payable to the state of Mississippi was under the CARES Act. And under the CARES Act, there were a number of different parts of the CARES Act that provided funds. Some of it was a governor's educational fund, which the governor received $34 million. In addition to that, the Department of Human Services and others received hundreds of millions of dollars as part of that transaction. When we came down about a week and a half ago, uh, approximately $1.25 million, billion dollars was placed in the state treasury. It was not designated for utilization by the executive branch of government. It was given to the state of Mississippi. It was given to the taxpayers of Mississippi. It was to be used to reimburse individuals that had expended money during this process, expended funds to cover COVID-19. It is not given to balance our budget. Unfortunately, it was not. So it's given to, get to reimburse groups like MEMA that have done a great job for the state of Mississippi, Department of Human Services, Department of Health, to be reimbursed those. The University of Mississippi Medical Center has expenses. When this occurred, the legislature, the, both the House and the Senate, requested the Legislative Budget Office to go forward and ask all of the state agencies, what do you need from this $1.25 billion? part of over $2.3 billion that came to the state of Mississippi. When we, get, when we asked for that, we got information from each of the agencies what they needed to be reimbursed. During the last three or four weeks or month or two months, I personally have repeatedly requested from state agencies, do you need any money? What do you need right now? Similarly, the speaker has done the same. He'll be speaking here in a moment. As I discussed with each of those agencies, they repeatedly told me, as recently as last night, that they did not need money immediately, that they needed reimbursement. And that included the University of Mississippi Medical Center, MEMA, Dr. Dobbs, and others. So these funds were given to the state of Mississippi to be appropriated by the state of Mississippi. The state of Mississippi appropriations, at least since 1890, have been done by the legislature. 174 people who are responsible, transparent, and elected by the people, not a third party administrator. So when we went through this whole entire process, we too began the process of making sure that the legislature would give the money that had been appropriated to the state of Mississippi, that portion, 1.25 billion, of approximately 2.3 billion that was appropriated to you. We started that process. We have had a disagreement with the executive branch. That disagreement involved whether or not the legislature should appropriate this in a timely, transparent manner, or should $1.25 billion be given to the executive without any regard for input from the individual state. That, that, that process went on until last evening, actually, when it became apparent there have been RFPs issued that were due May the 6th. There were other issues that became apparent to us. We were not able to, to reach an agreement with the executive branch as to how these funds should be expended. They were made to the state of Mississippi. Following the Constitution is real important. It's real important. In times like this, when we are so challenged by tornadoes and floods and pandemics, the rock that we hang on is the Constitution. And it says that, when the, it says that the legislature appropriates the money. So today, the legislature will come in and they'll decide, I don't get a vote on this, the Senate will get a vote on it, and the House of Representatives. They'll decide how this money is to be spent. That's the way it should be. So when this became apparent, we started talking to our senators and whatnot. Should we come back 
all, we had tremendous conversations with all of them. They want to come back and handle the duties that you elected them to do, to allocate this money, to reimburse people that need PPE, that have expended monies like this, and to set the stage for the future. In Mississippi, part of this will be in distance learning. I have, I have spoken with every, almost every superintendent in the Delta and superintendents all over the state of Mississippi. What are your needs? How are your children do? I have been to dozens of, cor of courses, from Hernando to St. Martin, from Columbus to Scott County. I go to class with these kids every day. And I listen to what they're saying. What are your needs? How is this going? Almost to a person, they want to be back in school. But distance learning is covering that gap right now. And it will cover the gap in the future for Mississippians as we have different uh, abilities that may be in one part of the state that may not be in another. That distance learning is a long-term solution. And this money needs to be done, to be used for every student to have an iPad or a Chromebook or have access to the internet. We've met with the co-ops, how are we gonna accelerate broadband coverage to every educational institution? That is the purvey of the legislature. When they purvey that, the executive branch comes and, 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 and carries out the instructions from the legislature. And that's what we're here about today. I want to make sure that everybody understands this will be transparent, fast, and it will be organized by the people you elected to spend the money. This particular part, we are not handicapping the executive branch when they have a tornado. We're not calling the National Guard. I call the National Guard, they're fine. We're not saying you can't buy PPE, you can't do emergency declarations. None of that is being discussed. It's a long-term expenditure of $1.25 billion that we're talking about today, and the legislature will be in, turn, uh, in, in session to do today. Obviously, we would have preferred to have this matter um, without having called the Mississippi legislature back into session. But we have done so. We are socially distancing. We've talked to Dr. Dobbs. We have people's temperature downtown, downstairs. We're going about the process of doing this as effectively and as efficiently as we can. Uh, I would have preferred not to be here today with calling my legislatures back. But there's something bigger than me and bigger than the rest of them. It's bigger than this building. And that's the Constitution. And that's who allocates the money that is paid to the state of Mississippi. We have a duty to do that and you will see the Mississippi legislature do that today. So I would like to turn it over to Philip Gunn, the Speaker of the House, Mr. Speaker. And I want to acknowledge too from our Senate side, David Blunt, where's David? Back here. We've got Daniel, we've got uh, President Pro Tem, Dean Kirby, and we've got, yes, our leader here, Senator Derek Simpson here. Thank you very much. Yeoman, good to see you, my good friend for many years. Good to see every one of you. David, good to see all of you. Nicole, nice to see you, Kathy Chisholm. I appreciate the senators coming and being with us early this morning. And, Mr. Speaker, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Lieutenant Governor. Appreciate that. Appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, I do, too, want to acknowledge that we are here in unity. We have with us the leaders of the Democratic Party, uh, the, the representatives of the House and the Senate. We want to recognize that uh, we are socially distancing. You and you are socially distancing, and that is great. I think it's important for the people of Mississippi, the people who we represent, to understand why we are resuming the legislature here today. Governor Reeves has said that his goal was to get coronavirus relief funds to the people without delay and that he did not want a political battle. Well, we agree. We have the same goals. And what we're doing here today is not about politics. It's about preserving the people's voice in government. The framers of our Constitution made sure that the people, through their legislators, would have a voice in how taxpayer money is spent. They did not give us government by one man. The people's voice in government is sacred. It is not anything to be lightly cast aside, and we intend to preserve it. We reject the notion that the government by the people cannot effectively deal with emergency situations. We reject 
any attempts to characterize what we're doing here today as a political battle or a power grab, as we've heard in recent days. The governor has recognized that the power to spend taxpayer money belongs to the legislature. But he says the legislature delegated that power to spend federal funds to the governor. He compared this situation to a tornado or a hurricane. He says it's no different than Hurricane Katrina or the 2008 physical crisis. We disagree. The facts are different. A tornado or a hurricane strikes a limited area or, and then it is over. The impact and response may go on, but the storm itself is short-lived. The coronavirus crisis, however, is felt everywhere by everyone. It touches every aspect of life, from health to work to education. It affects the entire state, and the virus itself is with us for many weeks and months. As the governor himself has stated many times, we are in uncharted waters. Emergency powers suited to dealing with localized and short-lived weather emergencies are not appropriate to deal with the ongoing statewide pandemic crisis that we are experiencing right now. The laws are different. The federal law that dealt with Hurricane Katrina and the 2008 federal stimulus crisis specifically stated that governors of the states would spend those funds. In contrast, the CARES Act provides that the $1.2 billion in coronavirus funds went to the state. The check was made to the state, not to the governor. Other provisions of the CARES Act, however, such as the governor's emergency education and relief fund, which is section 18002, specifically state that the governor decides how those funds are spent. Had Congress intended for the governor to have the authority to spend the coronavirus relief funds as he saw fit, they could have easily said so. They did not. The Mississippi statute that the governor references and continues to reference, which is 33-15-27, says that only the governor may, on behalf of the state, accept and receive funds. Nowhere in that statute does it say that the governor gets to spend those funds. That power remains with the legislature. There's also been a claim that uh, Mississippi Code Section 27-104-21 gives the governor the power to spend federal funds without legislative appropriation. But that statute says there can be no such expenditure except through a program that has already been authorized by an act of the legislature which would include appropriations. In other words, it doesn't give the governor the authority to fund any new relief programs. Yet the CARES Act makes clear that the coronavirus relief fund monies can only be used to fund new relief programs that were not authorized uh, in prior authorizations, uh, appropriations. So section 27-4-21 cannot be used to say that the governor can spend this money. Our courts have stated that the power to spend taxpayer money belongs with the legislature and that the legislature cannot delegate that authority even if it wanted to. Governor Reeves, when he was a state treasurer, and I know this was asked yesterday during his daily press conference, acknowledged that the legislature holds the power of the purse. In 2006, he was chairman of the board of the Mississippi Health Care Trust Fund. He argued that the Partnership for Healthy Mississippi could not spend a portion of the tobacco settlement money without legislative appropriation. Our Supreme Court agreed with him. It said, and I quote, we note the obvious. The legislature holds the purse strings. The control of the purse strings is, of government is a legislative function. Indeed, it is the supreme legislative prerogative indispensable to the independence and integrity of the legislature and not to be surrendered or abridged save by the Constitution itself without disturbing the balance of the system and endangering the liberties of the people. The right of the legislature to control the public treasury to determine the sources from which the public revenue shall be derived and the objects upon which they shall be expended to dictate the time, manner, and the means both of their collection and disbursement is firmly and inexpugnably established 
by our political system. That was stated in Colbert versus State in 1905 and restated again in 2006 during this case. I want to highlight a few of those comments that the Supreme Court used. First, it said, we note the obvious, the legislature holds the purse strings. Secondly, it is the sp supreme legislative prerogative. Thirdly, it cannot be surrendered. And fourthly, it is firmly established in our political system. So regardless of any reading of the statutes upon which uh, the governor or others claim they have the right to appropriate money, if those statutes are interpreted the way they claim, then those statutes are unconstitutional and should be set aside as being unconstitutional. Unconstitutional acts don't become constitutional through repetition. Even if it's been allowed in the past, it doesn't make it constitutional. So in 2006, our governor, Tate Reeves, defended these same liberties when he advocated that only the people's legislative representatives can appropriate taxpayer money. He was right in 2006, and we're right today in 2020 in defending those same liberties. And we intend to protect those same liberties in 2020 and always. The governor says that by letting him spend the money, he can get it where it needs to go more quickly. That makes for a good sound bite, but what voice does that give the citizens in that decision-making process? Who speaks for the citizens in that process? Where is the opportunity for the citizen to have any say in how those monies are spent? There is none. Under our system of government, the only place and the one place where the citizens have the voice in how their taxpayer dollars are spent is in the legislature. We too want to get the money out as quickly as possible. And moving towards that goal, we have already received from the agencies an estimate of the, the not an estimate, but a calculation of the monies they have already expended. We've also received an estimate from them as to how much they think they're going to spend through June 30th. Uh, yes, through June 30th. We've also received an estimate from them as to how much they think they're going to spend through December 30th. We've already had the legal staff and elbow staff examine how this money can be spent. We've begun, begun to put together teams to formulate plans to help small businesses, to help the distance learning problems that we've encountered, to help our cities and towns, to help restart our economy, to help our counties. Throughout this pandemic, we've heard from Mississippians and agencies regarding their needs and expenses. The actions we take today will ensure that all Mississippians, not just a select few, have a voice in how these funds are spent. The governor has claimed that some emergency may arise where he needs money to act quickly to address a need. Some have claimed that the legislative process is too slow or cumbersome to respond quickly to the needs of an emergency. Well, even if that is true, it doesn't justify throwing out the constitutional rights of the citizens and throwing it in the trash can and ignoring their rights to have a voice in their government. This is the type of mentality that says the government knows better than you how to spend your money. But even if it is true, I'm willing to appropriate some of the money to the governor's office. I'm willing to give him some of these funds. If he makes us aware of a need where he needs to act quickly, we're fine with appropriating some money to him for that purpose. All he has to do is let us know where he needs it and when he needs it, and we'll be glad to work with him in that regard. I'm willing to, to, to do that. So the argument that the governor is unable to meet any needs quickly has no merit. We're willing to help him address whatever those needs are. All he's got to do is let us know. We hold Governor Reeves in high regard. What we do today is not personal. We still pledge to work with him to meet the needs of all Mississippians, not just a select few. We look forward to working with him to provide prompt relief to people who are suffering, both of the coronavirus in a way that preserves their voice in government. We can do both. Representative government is not perfect. Sometimes it is messy, but it must not be abandoned even and especially in a time of emergency. That is why we take the actions that we take here today. And we want the citizens of our state who we represent to understand that. 
I think uh, that's all I have to say. Do we want to answer questions, Lieutenant Governor? Well, I think we're going to let uh, okay. Robert and uh, Derek speak. We have others have who wish to speak. Who wants to go first can go first. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. As the Senate Minority Leader, I fully support the appropriation authority of the Mississippi Legislature. It is through that constitutional right, Mississippians' rights are protected. They have an opportunity to have input in this process and oversight over how funds are spending. We are here today in a bipartisan effort to make sure the $1.25 billion of the CARES funds are spent properly. Thank you. I'm here today because I'm a member of the legislature, and I know what my duties are and our responsibilities are to the people and the citizens of the state of Mississippi. I'm here for the sole purpose of saying it's my job, our job, as members of the legislature, to appropriate and, and spend that money. I'm also here because I've spent the last two or three days speak, w working and talking to the speaker and the lieutenant governor, and we have worked together to help prioritize and talk about the priorities that, as minority leader, we have identified. Some of those priorities are uh, child care, uh, special and direct aid to cities and counties who need help, uh, the uh, health care, enhancing health care in those underserved communities that, that we represent. Uh, we know that there are populations in this state have been uh, disparately affected. We have assurances from both House leaders that they're going to pay close attention and help us prioritize those issues. And we know that because we work with them and we're talking to them and we have an opportunity to work together. I would, I would say to you that in this country, we are a democratic republic. In this state, we are a democratic republic. In this state, in any other state, these institutions, like the legislature, are designed to protect the individual, the rights of the individual, and the rights of the minority from the, from the tyranny of the majority. Well, today, what you have are the majority and the minority working together to protect the interests of the people and the citizens of the state of Mississippi, and that is our job, and that's what we're here to do today. And we're glad to be able to work with the House and the Senate to get that done. Thank you.